Okay, we're going to just sidetrack just a little bit and then talk about magnetos, and then we'll come back to what we're doing. And this is going to be a review for next week. So a magneto is something that is a self-contained unit that creates the spark for the engine. Engines have two magnetos, and the reason why is because you want redundancy. If one magneto fails, you still have another one driving another set of spark plugs. So it's unlike a car where if you lose the battery and then you lose the alternator, the car is going to die because it's a battery ignition system. And we'll go over battery ignition uh, next week. But in a magneto, the first thing you have is you have a rotating magnet. And in that magnet, you have poles. You have a north pole and a south pole because it's a magnet. And within that, within a magnet, as we've talked about before, I believe, that you have lines of flux that find their way from the north to the south. So if this magnet is just sitting here in the air, it's gonna look, these lines of flux are actually gonna be going through the air. And if you put a piece of paper over it and put some iron filings, you would actually see that. But our magneto rotor is not actually in the air. It is actually within, contained within a housing and in the housing, there is a pole shoe. <coughs> and a pole shoe extension. So pole shoe and pole shoe extension. So this is the extension, this is the pole shoe. And they've got to be very, very close to the magnet. And the reason why they're very close to the magnet is you want the lines of flux to make a path through. Now at the end of the pole shoe extension sits the coil core. So there's the core of the coil and it's laminated and these are all laminated here. Why are they laminated? Eddy 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 currents. All right, so I'm gonna let, so right now this isn't what is called full register. And full register means that all the lines of flux uh, the north is right here and the south is here, so it's in the strongest position. These lines of flux are coming around and going down like this. All right, so they're all traveling through here. Now, even though they're traveling through here like that, you have leakage out of here, we could say. And so a magnetic field is built up around here. And a circular it expands out, so you have this magnetic field. Well, this rotor is going to turn around and round and round. And right now it's in full register, which would be the strongest point. But in a little bit, it's going to change. So where the north is here and the south is here. And when it's that way, it's called the neutral position. And the neutral position, let this be zero, is on the zero line. So neutral is here. And full register, full register, I'll just abbreviate, is up here. And so and it's at neutral, it's here. And it builds up, builds up, and goes to full register. And then as the magneto starts to rotate more, it's going to leave that uh, full register position and go back to neutral. And then it's going to swing the other way and come back up. And it's going to keep doing this. And so that's what the lines of flux look like if you look just at what's happening with this magneto, uh, magnetic circuit. Well, in addition to the magnetic circuit, <clears throat> we have wires that are actually wound around this coil core. Uh, I'm not real good at drawing the around the coil core bit there, so I'm just going to represent them next to it. And so I will say that right along here, I have a coil of wire, rather heavy wire. Take that and run it over this way, and I'm going to put that on a switch. <coughs> and so what happens now is I've built the transformer. And if you remember the transformer we built before, where it looked like this, I had a primary, I had a secondary, I had a coil core in the middle. Can you see the, see the similarities? What, where did I get my power for this primary coil before? From a what? Okay, from an AC generator. It's plugged into the wall. Something else made electricity and brought it to us. 
Well, I'm looking down here at the magneto. What's making the electricity in this? Magnetic, okay, so it's got to make its own electricity. So just like a generator, it's got magnets that are rotating around in there. And so these magnets are going around. Now, yes, I could put everything right next to the magnet, but it doesn't work out well. I got to move this magnetic lines of flux and bring it up here. That's what all of this pole shoe business is about. You got to get it up here, concentrate it up here. And so as this is rotating, I, okay, so over here with, uh, with this one, we have something that made the electricity. And when it made the electricity, it made this into an electromagnet, so to speak. Well, okay, we don't have an electromagnet over here. We have a magnet magnet. Follow? So this magnet magnet, it's not what it's called, when it's up here in full register, my lines of flux as they're coming around, my lines of flux, oops, lines of flux are blue, lines of flux are coming out. And what are they doing to that coil? Okay, I got cutting across the coil, the conductor. Would anybody else want to throw something out? Expanding. Expanding across it. Okay. Moving. Moving across it. These are all wonderful things. The lines of flux from the magnetic circuit are cutting across the windings. Is the magnetic flux flowing through them? No. Absolutely not. There is no flow of them. It's cutting across it. So now we go back to what we talked about before. I have lines of flux, a magnetic field, same word, cutting across wire, which creates a current. A current. A current. All right. Now, uh, if I just take a magnet and put it next to a piece of wire, do I get? No. Got to have relative motion. What is my relative motion? The, is it the spinning the rotor? rotor? No. It is not the spinning rotor. The spinning rotor does not itself the movement. It is the way that, over here on the green, it is the way that it builds up flux and collapses flux and builds it up and collapses it and builds it up and collapses it. it has nothing to do with the fact that it's rotating in circles. Rotating in circles is how we get it to build up and fall and build up and fall and reverse directions. That just happens to be what it is. But that's down here, the circular bit. So it's, I don't know, it's kind of confusing, but I'm hearing that, well, because it's turning in circles. Not really. If I could leave it there and not move it, but somehow build and contract and build and contract, which is exactly what's happening up here with the transistor. The transistor, I keep saying that. The transformer, it's building and contracting, building and contracting. Is there anything moving up here? Are there any moving parts? No. Okay. <clears throat> so, yes, I have a moving part down here. That's not really the point. The point is, again, it's the fact that it is allowing lines of flux to build up to a maximum, cutting across a wire, and then it goes the other way and collapses. And it also cuts across the, back, the coil that way, too. So it's collapsing? Yeah, it's cutting across the coil. That's what I said. Both, both ways. Too. Both ways. It builds up. That's a good thing. It's movement. And then it collapses. That is movement. So. As far as this coil of wire goes in the primary, it doesn't care if it was a buildup or a collapse. Buildup or collapse, it's happy either way. It's the same to it. Builds up at the same speed, collapses at the same speed. So as far as that one goes, primary, that's fine. Okay, so, so right now we build up across here. So what does that do in the primary? All right now it doesn't do anything. <laughs> okay, so creates a current in the primary. Mm -hmm. Now, get rid of some of this. So we built a current in the primary. So okay, hopefully everybody could see that. Where, how did I get current in the primary? Relative motion, Relative motion between the magnetic field, the magnetic flux that was generated by the rotor and the stationary <laughs> primary wire. I've induced a voltage. I now have voltage in my primary. End of story? No. Well, that's the primary. Okay. We'll, we'll get into more depth next week. But over here, I have a cam. Right now it's closed. I have a cam. So I get some current flowing through this right here. Well, if I've got current flowing through a wire, what do I create? A magnetic field. So a magnetic field, a true magnetic field, off of a magnet, 
created a induced a voltage into and current flow into the primary. Because it induced voltage and current in the primary, the primary also builds up its own magnetic field. So now I got this made a magnetic field, right? Okay, and guess what's next to it? Secondary. Secondary, with lots and lots and lots of windings. All right, and so the primary builds up and it expands across the secondary. Now, this time it's a little bit different. It builds up and really it builds up rather slow for our purposes. So in this case, we're not going to use the build up and collapse. It's just going to build up across it and the secondary is going, yeah, good for you. You built up across. I really don't care. Um, but, um, and we'll, so we'll get into this next week because it gets more complicated. Once it's built up, this is going to open up. And because of the way I'm going to show you next week, it interacts with this right here. It is going to build up and cause a rapid and sudden, shockingly fast collapse. And because of the relative speed, speed makes a difference. So um, because of the super rapid collapse of the field of the primary, when I open this switch and kill it, it is going to induce a massive amount of voltage, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 volts. And then from there, it's going to go out to the spark plugs. And I'm going to explain why it does that next week. I, I'm asking you to explain this during the oral, that, that the magnet has flux and a field that cuts across the primary. That induces a voltage in the primary. The primary has a voltage, which builds up. That cuts across the secondary. When the points open, there is a <coughs> rapid and sudden collapse of the primary, causing an induced voltage in the secondary, which is a step-up transformer here. <laughs> you did? Did Tom do your order? We don't know either. Questions on this? Yes? Were you recording? Yeah. <laughs> You're probably not explaining it next week anyway, but I'm just wondering all the difference between the static flux and uh, EL flux. Oh, yeah, we are definitely going to get into that. And that's where this curve starts uh, extended out and yeah. Lens Law and everything else. So, but since you guys are really on the struggle bus with this. Uh, oh, I meant the struggle bus for sure. I said struggle bus. Oh. <laughs> I said you're on the struggle bus. Part of the reason why you're on the struggle bus is because your textbook says something to the... Do you want to say it? You say it very well. No, she wants want to say it. No. <laughs> Sophia can dang near quote the, quote the book, which is something the effect of the magnet goes around, there's lines of flux that travel, and because of that, there is an induced voltage. Or something, I think that's even more information the book has. Induces current. Well, that's what I wanted to add. Because then, then after that, it says once the polarity switch, if you get to the E gap past neutral, and then the switch opens, it's like it it, over, it induces more flux, and then that's what causes the jump from the primary to the secondary. Yeah, that's like basically what it says. Yeah. All right, so we'll cover that. It, it gets into a lot more depth where this this uh, I don't I don't we'll take up the rest of the day with that when we used up too much time, but. Um, this is what you need to know, really, I mean, right now. I mean, the E-gap stuff is going to be very important, but uh, this will get you through it. E-gap, what is E-gap? This is what, I'm not going to write it. This is what you should write down. I say, what is E-gap? You should say, it is the number of degrees past neutral at which the points open. That's all I care about. The number of degrees past neutral at which the points open. And why neutral? Because neutral is right here. Why not here? Because this is the most change. And 10 degrees past is right here. And what, it looks Christmassy. And so what happens is because of Lenz Law, uh, as this starts to fall out, the, uh, the current in the primary does not want to follow it. It hangs on because of, remember Lenz Law? Yes. As one thing, so it's out here. And so there's all this stress on the, they call it in your books, says there's stress on the magneto. Uh, because 
the, uh, the magnetic flux, the true magnetic flux off the rotors all the way down here, and this is still open in a minute, it's going to start following it like that. But um, hey, why not just open the points right here? And so instead of it starting to fall off, it just, it's got nowhere to go. And so it's going to come all the way down here. That's a massive amount of change. We're looking for that change, sudden and rapid change, and that's how you're going to get it. So. All right. Back to our regularly regularly scheduled program. That was not good to say. Uh, let's see. Oh, we can get back to that later. Hey, everybody's pencils are sharp? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So guess what I'm going to talk about right now? Logic gates. Now, here's the wonderful thing about the FAA, and they make them very simplistic for us. And it doesn't appear that there's any sort of electrical input, they just work. It's like, well, how can two opens produce an on when there's nothing going through? And, but that's okay. Huh? That's like the Q&A ones? Like ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so logic gates. Logic gates. Um, make sure I'm at the right spot here. Yeah, logic gates. All right. Um, they are our functions functions performed by, for some reason I wrote computers or circuit boards and then I crossed out computers. Somebody probably argued with me about that. Probably not. <laughs> I'm going to write it anyway, computers or circuit boards. Watch them complain tomorrow. Doesn't. All right, it is based on, based on Boolean logic. You ever heard of that one? Nope. Boolean logic. If you haven't, I bet Prince has Boolean logic, right? Okay. Huh? Okay. Have you? Yeah. Okay then. <laughs> and and where where is Boolean logic actually used most? Huh? Computers. Um, believe it or not, Google actually uh, allows you to use Boolean logic in your search engines. Huh? Soup, yes. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a good joke on that. Um, Boolean logic of and and or not. Uh, so when you're, I don't know if anybody does this, when you're searching something on Google, like, um, oh, it's something crazy that always comes up. Well, I'll tell you a fun story. Um, you know, when I started doing this, this was before computers, and then, you know, as I was, you know, computers came along as I was in the industry, and there's this thing called Roseanne studs uh, that are used on engines, and they're horrible, and I hate dealing with them, and, and I'll, I'll explain it in, in some other time, but um, it, more or less, it's a, a stud that goes into something that's got a locking ring that it pounds into the base metal, into, into recess. What? That's a Roseanne stud. I don't know. Um, Anyway, you got you have to have a cutter, and you have to, it goes over the stud with these teeth. It goes down and it cuts out the lock ring. You got to pull it out, that ruining the base metal. And anyway, I was in really, I was in need of a new uh, Roseanne cut stutter. And so, as you know, anybody would do with computers that are new, you go to the computer and you type in the word stud. Oh, God. <laughs> Did not go well for me there. Yeah. So I could have used Boolean logic and put stud and then capital words not, and then something like um, <coughs> Magic Mike, you know. So, <laughs> so you can actually use Boolean logic words in, uh, in Google. Probably not the best example, but it's one came to mind. Sorry about that. Uh, there are seven commonly used ones. And the bad news is, outside of just memorizing them, I don't really know what to tell you on that one. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you can. You can if you memorize some of the simple ones. You can. So logic gates. Well, we'll do the seven of them. One. So we'll start with the and. And with each one, there's a truth table. And so if you understand the truth table, it kind of makes sense to it. So an and is where all inputs, inputs must be one. Must be one. And one is on basically to produce a one out. All right, and so that looks, I should probably just, uh, you know, get some pictures of them, um, like that. So these are the inputs over here. So this is input, this is the out. And so if I look at a truth table, inputs, outputs, we have pin A, pin B, so pin A, pin B. So if A is a zero and B is a zero, the output will also be zero. If I have a one and a zero, meaning this is on, this is off, then the output is also gonna be zero. That's a one and that's a zero, that's a zero, and a one and a one equals one. And if I were gonna draw this in a um, analog type way, it would actually look Oops, like two switches. I could say the light be on. So if, there we go. So if switch A is closed and switch B is closed, then I get an output. If B is closed and one is open, B is closed, one and A is open, the light's gonna be off, right? So it's just an analog way of looking at it. So, so that's your and. Um, have an or. So number two would be or. Or any input. Any input of one will produce one. Will produce one. So that one looks. that not quite um, so truth table so input output last year I did this on the board so I could just keep erasing this right here um, let's see truth table so a B so zero and a zero would be zero, zero. zero. okay so that's a B um, any input of one will produce one so um, zero and one I get a one, one. one. all right you got it one and zero is one. one, and one and one is one. two. One. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I can do analogs for some of these, then they start to get complicated. So that's kind of like this. So either one of those closed, we're going to get. If they're both open, the light is off. If A closes, the light's on. If B closes, the light's on. If A and B are closed, the light is on. So three. Three, three, three. All right, an invert or not. Invert. Invert or a not. Reverses the condition. Reverses the condition. And basically what that is, anytime you put a little circle, a little dot on something, so like this one is a triangle, that little dot means change everything around. Yeah, the analog for this one is very difficult, um, but I made one up. Input, uh, input, output. Oops, I'm sorry, I think this one only has one. There we go. Make it correct. There we go. So input, um, an input of zero, and you're going to get a one. An input of one, you're going to get a zero. zero. Okay. You want to see my analog for this one? All right, give it a shot. All right, so.
there we go. So this is the input right here. So um, with a normally closed switch here, this is the input. So whenever the input is open, the light will be on, right? And then if I close the switch, since this is normally closed, this will energize this, opening the switch, and that will be off. So when this is like that, <laughs> that probably takes more explaining to do than just the... Yeah. Um, all right, I got four. Um, the nor. Nor, which is also called an inverted or. Inverted or. So, all right, input, output, this time it's got A and B, and C is out, so A, B, C. All right, so now we're just going to invert it. So if inputs are zero and zero, output's going to be? One. one. Oops, I forgot to put this. There's the invert, one. Uh, zero, one, zero. Zero, one, zero. One, zero. zero. Zero and one one zero. zero. All right, you guys are doing great. So five is the NAND, N A N D, which is inverted AND. So we just take the AND and invert it. Circle. So a zero and a zero is going to equal a one. One and a zero would equal a one. Because in an and, you should have one and one should be a zero. So just remember to invert it. So zero and one is going to be one. And then a one and one is going to be zero. So five. Two more to go. Six, exclusive, exclusive or design to produce a one output whenever input is dissimilar. This one's a little different looking. Let's get this. There we go. A, B, C. So input, output, pins A, B, C. So input, uh, zero and zero is going to be a zero. zero. Produce a one when output is dissimilar. Zero, one, 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 zero. One, one, zero. One, one, zero. Last but not least, of these seven common ones, the exclusive nor, which produces a pattern. Um, I should say an output pattern, output pattern exactly opposite that of an exclusive <coughs> or, or gate. And that would look just like the one I just drew. <coughs> so with the circle meaning invert. So input Output pins A, B, and C. Input, so if I have a zero and a zero, I'm going to get a one. one. And a zero and a one. Zero, one, zero. Zero, one, one, one. All right. Like I said, other than just trying to memorize them, which you know I'm not a big proponent of memorizing stuff like that, um, I have ElectroDroid, and it has all of them. Yep. Let me see. Can you use that on the test? 
I'm not going to let you use my phone on the test. <coughs> At least I thought it did somewhere. Bring our own. Your own phone? No. Maybe it doesn't have it. I thought it did somewhere. <coughs> Electro droid. Oh, Booyah Logic Gates. There we go. And or not NAND nor XOR and XNOR. Yeah, I got all the seven up there. Don't even have to worry about it. Huh? It's on the program. What program? Uh, logically. Oh, it's, it's not an FA thing. All right. I believe. XNOR is the exclusive NOR, right? Yes. XNOR. Is it? Wait, I said yes. Um, yeah. XNOR is exclusive XNOR is, yes, this one right here. XNOR. That's E. Sorry, EX or XNOR. So it's just take the X. So that's X and O R right there. Next door.